All right, so welcome to Environmental Fridays. We are um, having in this series 15 guest lectures, 14 expert speakers, and this is going to happen every Friday. Well, at least the scheduled Fridays between now and February 2021. Um, it's a free series for anyone who would like to join us. Um, it's part of uh, our grade 12, grade 10 chemistry class here at the Berrien Risa Math Science Center. And I posted links online. So anyone that's outside that wants to learn more about Berrien Risa Math Science Center could do so. And the students are gonna be um, engaged in creating public science announcements. And some of them will be based on these lectures that they will hear. Uh, the lecturers, some of them would help uh, mentor students in the different topics they may select. Uh, if you wanna see previous PSAs, videos, I have mm -hmm. a link uh, here too in the chat. And if anyone um, would like to ask questions, you could ask in the chat. And of course, my students will ask right here. So our speaker today, our very first speaker for the Environmental Fridays is Dr. Anne St. Amand, Amand. And she actually is a local environmental scientist. Um, she owns and is the president of a company called FICO Tech in St. Joseph. And she has history with us. She's done this before <laughs> for us. And so it's great to welcome you back, Anne. Thank you. All right. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. Okay. All right, guys, okay. So it's early, I know 8 a.m. is early, so uh, we'll try to make this um, fun and entertaining as, as well as informational. So um, as Dr. Murray said, I am an uh, environmental scientist and I own a company locally called FICOTECH and um, I have been in business for a fairly long time. Uh, scary how long I've been in business since 1990. And so, um, you know, my charge is talk to y'all about careers in environmental science. Um, in your chemistry class, so even though I am at heart a biologist, um, I'm going to kind of talk to you about the nexus of those two things. Um, it's interesting because I have found that uh, even though business can be somewhat cutthroat, environmental sciences is a little different because people go uh, to those careers in environmental science because they have a sense of wonder about their world because it's fun, it's cool. There's a sense of stewardship um, that most environmental scientists have. On average, I have to tell you, uh, it makes it a kinder business environment um, when you're working. Uh, it's non-conventional. I do not have to dress up for work. And in fact, right now I'm wearing my Science Olympiad t-shirt, which I will show you real quick. It uh, says sarcasm in the periodic table. Um, so uh, it's challenging. And unfortunately for most environmental scientists, um, we are a little more subject to politics because it affects state and federal funding. So, um, and, and right now it's a tough environment to, to be an environmental scientist, especially one who works on climate change like I do. So, um, so there's a lot of things that draw people to environmental science um, that make it a pretty cool business atmosphere to work in. I am specifically a water quality uh, person who works in water quality. My degree is in aquatic ecology. And um, within that umbrella, there's things like climate change and harmful algal blooms. Um, whenever you see scums and you hear about dead elephants, right, in, uh, in Africa or South Africa, depending on where they are, um, animals, people, um, harmful algal blooms affect the U.S. a lot. That's what I specifically work on a lot. In fact, I have scope, uh, samples on my scope right now from Zion National Park that are uh, toxic algae samples. Hydrogeology, if you like modeling, if you like math, 
if you like working with the public, um, there's a lot of a uh, lot of work that has to be done with stewardship specifically, and that is the combination of social science and science. So just because you might not be a hardcore mathematician or a hardcore chemist or a hardcore biologist, we also need people who can interface all of us with the public and with um, people who, in my case, live on lakes. Methods development. Um, I do a lot with TMDLs, which is an EPA uh, mandate that regulation that large water bodies that have impacts, negative impacts to their water have to develop the maximum amount of phosphorus that can come down any river system at, at a daily basis. Um, and natural history. And natural history is a lot of what I do actually. And um, natural history is kind of passe, but really important. And uh, it has to do with how connected you are to your resource, because if you don't understand the organisms that you're studying, chemistry doesn't matter. So um, if you think about in a, in a standard environmental science type of career, um, most of the time, um, you're going to have a specific flow. And that flow is, is that usually your project is going to start with a grant submission or a contract. Um, I do both uh, base research and contract work, mostly contract work. Um, then you have to go out and you actually have to do the field work to collect the samples. Um, and that includes study design and the actual sample collection. Study design, that this is hugely important. Study design is very, very important. Um, because you should always have your goal in any scientific uh, in any scientific process. You need to define your goal before you do the project. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, you could be surprised how many samples I get from people who have collected the samples and then tried to decide their goal. So, um, and that limits what they can do with their samples. So um, then you're gonna have to take those samples, you're gonna have to analyze them, you have to process your field samples. And in chemistry parlance, um, that creates some issues because lakes are messy, streams are messy, and there's lots of things that interfere with chemical analyses. So if I want to do phosphate at depth in a lake, uh, say um, not so much Lake Michigan, but say Lake Erie, um, at a certain depth, their oxygen goes away. And at that point you get sulfur in the water and that interferes with phosphate analysis. So you have to be able to understand that water chemistry to accommodate for your analysis and then I have to accommodate for that when I when I actually interpret the data. And that's this part down here, which is the data analysis part. So you have to generate the data and then you have to analyze the data. Um, if you are a statistics geek, if you like things like uh, statistical significance and t-tests and things that uh, in your math class you're just now getting into, um, this is the place for you. We do a lot of sophisticated statistics in environmental science specifically because our stuff is messy. So uh, one thing you will learn if you haven't learned already is that you have, and you've heard this before, but you might not have realized it, random uh, trials, that's hugely important. And, um, and also you have to have things that are normally distributed. So that bell curve, right? And uh, in biology, there's two things you almost never get to have. One of those is random and one of those is a bell curve. And so we have to use some pretty sophisticated uh, math when we analyze our data in aquatic ecology and any kind of environmental science. Um, and, and you've probably heard that kind of talk when they're talking about these large uh, vaccine trials, right? They're trying to get double blind studies. They're trying to do things where they have both people who have been exposed and not exposed to the vaccine. In lakes, think about that. It's much harder to do that in a lake in a stream uh, or in the environment anywhere actually usually looking at a highly impacted site. And that sort of takes out most of your chances for randomness and good study design. So you have to be pretty innovative. Report generation, which is important. So if you're an English geek, if you like to write, that's very important in environmental science because it's easy to confuse people. And you have to be clear and you have to be concise when you communicate. And you have to do it in a way that doesn't put people to sleep in five seconds. So um, it's, it's important to be able to be able to communicate clearly to all levels. That is different. Um, I have a friend who works at Eli Lilly. He's a, a PhD chemist and uh, works on their QAQC line. And he only has to deal with other, with other chemical geeks, right? I have to deal with people who include 80-year-old lake, uh, lake owners and also highly, you know, double PhD, sometimes triple PhD. Um, chemists and professionals. And so I have to, to 
um, bridge a much larger educational and interest rate than, than my friend who works at Eli Lilly. So if you're in environmental sciences, you're more likely than not gonna have to be called on to communicate across those different levels. And then that report, that all important report is gonna end up in either a mitigation where you're trying to clean something up or a policy change. And I have contributed to both of those. Um, so what we do at FICA Tech? Well, as you tell behind me, um, I uh, look under the microscope. This is Spirogyra, it's a green algae. It's a spring algae, um, also comes back sometimes in the fall. Um, kind of looks like a green cloud in the water if you ever look for it. And um, zooplankton and, and macroinvertebrates. So I look for zebra mussel villagers, which is a, a larval stage of zebra mussels and quagga mussels. But most of my time I spend on the microscope and most of my time I'm looking at algae or at zooplankton. Uh, I consult on toxic algae and invasive species, uh, both plants and algae in and around water, but mostly in North America. And I consult with uh, all sorts of local state federal agencies about field study designs, long range monitoring and research projects. Right now I'm working on a big research project in Lake Okeechobee, trying to figure out what cues their blooms my part is the biology, um, both using remote sensing and microscope work and something called a imaging flow cytobot. And then we're combining that with all sorts of hardcore water chemistry, epigenetics, genetics, culturing. It is the first synoptic study that I have ever known of where we have done everything all at once and it is a three year study. Um, and it's gonna be super awesome if it doesn't kill me. So, uh, and then as I said before, I participate in both contract work and research. That's a little unusual, um, but it's because I'm a consultant. So I walk this line between business and science all the time. Um, about 90% of my time is on the microscope. And then I have to manage my business. I have to interface with the bank. I have to do the consulting um, with folks, which generally um, I don't get paid for. Um, it leads to sample analysis and money down the line but this would be the equivalent of cold calling if I were in sales, um, which it's a good thing I'm not in sales because I would starve. Um, and we do a lot of methods development at FICO Tech, uh, our IFCB, our imaging flow cytobot, who I have named Phoebe. So if you become a chemist at any point in your life, uh, you will have instrumentation and I can guarantee you will name your instruments. Um, I do outreach, I do a lot of outreach. This is part of that. And, um, and then I'm always having to learn new skills and, and Believe it or not, um, what I do, taxonomy, algal ecology is constantly changing. The science is constantly advancing. And so I have to do a fair bit of, of, of my own homework every night um, and every morning. And of course I am married. I've been married for 36 years. I have four kids and two grandkids. Um, notice this list does not add up to 100%. Um, and uh, in your lives ultimately, uh, as uh, Ruth Ginsburg said, you can have everything, you just can't have everything at the same time. And so, uh, you know, there's a lot of balancing that goes on in my life. Um, sometimes I'm out of balance and sometimes I'm more in balance, kind of depends. Um, I often bite off more than I can chew. So I spend a lot of time trying to keep uh, my ducks in a row. Um, so amazingly, when I, you know, my path is a little circuitous is how I ended up in aquatic ecology. But uh, in biochemistry, I, in biology, I actually draw on quite a bit of um, biochemistry. Not my best subject, but I, but I do a lot of chemistry, a lot of physics. Who knew? I use a massive amount of geometry in my job. So any of you who think that you will never be using a certain subject, uh, you might be using a lot of that subject uh, down the road. Who knew? Um, and that's because we do something called biovolume. Uh, algae are microscopic for the most part, even these guys behind me are hard to see. And so we estimate their volume based on their uh, conformation, whether it's a cylinder or a sphere or a funky thing. And, um, and then we assume a density of one and convert that to a biomass based on that. There are a lot of assumptions and a lot of correction factors. It is a whole lot of variation, but that's how we estimate um, individual contributions from different species. A lot of history and national, natural history and ecology, that's really where, I, where most of what I live is. Um, a lot of sophisticated database programming. What I do generates a lot of data points. That is a problem. And, um, and we have, over the years, constantly tried to keep up with the technology so we could handle all the data points. We, we generate a lot more data points than most industries do. Um, 
And so if you think about it, if I'm out doing a profile on the lake and I need to know what the pH is, what the oxygen is, what the conductivity is, um, what the salinity is, what nutrients there are, and then uh, there's maybe up to 30, 40 of those parameters I can add in. And then I add in anywhere from 30 to 250 species on top of that and all of their measurements. It is a huge data requirement. Um, we do, we're working on artificial intelligence, um, having our challenges with it, but we're working on it. If it were easy, somebody would have done it by now. A lot of optics and high-end analysis. I just had to replace my microscope camera um, to the tune of $10,000 because my old microscope camera, which was still perfectly good, would not interface with Windows 7. It would not, or wouldn't work with Windows 10. And as many of you may know, Windows 10 became a requirement uh, at the end of last year, and they no longer supported Windows 7, which made it a security risk. And I have had uh, cryptovirus come into my, my facility before. Um, so we have to, I had to upgrade, which meant I also had to buy a new computer. So uh, that simple change by Microsoft resulted in about $15,000 of, of input on my part. Um, we do a lot of remote sensing. I'm working with USGS now on a remote sensing project in Upper Klamath Lake, looking at do different toxic algae have different spectra that they can see in, in satellite data. The non-technical areas that I use, which still require a lot of skill are communications and public speaking. It took me a long time um, to get a little comfortable at public speaking. I'm not very good at it. Um, so I let the geek take over and that seems to make up for it. Social sciences, um, it's interesting. I also do a lot of uh, consultation on native landscaping for erosion control and habitat. And um, it tends to look a little different than structured traditional landscaping. And they've actually done studies uh, which show that people in a neighborhood will look at somebody's landscape that isn't traditional and assume that they're not um, as good a person as somebody who is traditional. So we all have biases and um, it's, been, it's a lot of work to uh, get people to understand why you do things the way that you do them. And then the business financial part, also something I never thought of, never really had the chance to take those classes in college, either in grad school or in undergrad. Um, and so I had to take a, cr a crash course in how to balance a budget and um, money's real. So uh, I can't pay my staff with something on a piece of paper. I have to pay my staff with cash. And so uh, I've had to do a lot more of that. I had to apply for a PPP, um, which is that uh, loan that allowed businesses to be able to keep their employees uh, on staff during the initial parts of the shutdown. So um, amazingly, it was not a government problem. It was a private company problem that caused me to have to do that. But it, it allowed me to easily stay in business. I would have stayed in business anyway. I wouldn't have not necessarily had stayed in business with all my employees. Um, the hardest thing I do is managing people. And I do a hard job. Uh, it's, people look at biology and go, oh, it's just biology. Well, I'm integrating physics and chemistry and biology and climate change and human behavior and, and environmental behavior all the time. And um, keeping my staff on task and on point um, and happy uh, is even with the great staff I have is complicated and um, people are messy. And so it, it never ends. And so uh, it helps, I think, that I'm a parent. <laughs> Sometimes I will admit, uh, just y'all, that um, I, I, it helps having parenting experience when I have employees. Um, right now I have a really stable, highly trained staff. I'm very thankful for my staff right now. Um, I got some great people. It hasn't always been that way. And so, um, you know, it's, it's challenging. So what I do, um, I don't know if you guys have remember hearing about the issues in Lake Erie, but um, Lake Erie has persistent blooms of toxic algae. It is a combination of nutrients coming in um, from the Maumee River uh, and this, this lower part of Lake Erie. Lake Erie is a perfect storm. Uh, it's the shallowest of the Great Lakes. It's the warmest of the Great Lakes. And there's a huge amount of agriculture that happens here. I actually used to spend my summers not just south of, of Toledo um, and have been in this area, Sandusky, a lot. Um, I have pictures of me when I was 12 playing on the beach with dead fish. At that point, it was oxygen and chemicals. Now it's toxic algae. And this is my picture, and this is the picture of that. So um, when zebra mussels came into that lake, and they started having all this huge input of nutrients from agriculture. The zebra mussels ate all the good algae. 
um, don't like this algae, they actually reject it. And so that's the only thing that's there now. And um, this is from 2015, I believe. This year was not too bad, um, but they have these blooms every year. And you have to really understand hydrogeology. You have to understand water flow. Um, climate change is huge um, because we have more summer, less winter. And um, these things are built to last and, and they like hot temperatures um, and they like lots of nutrients. And so uh, they're feeding off of all of those things. And so I will help them do the counts. I'm potentially gonna maybe um, work on some research in this part of the lake or maybe right there at Toledo with um, hanging in this instrumentation off their, off their sampling crib. Um, and I get called for people like this. So um, right now I'm working with Zion National Park, but I also do a little bit of work uh, in Michigan. Most of my work is not in Michigan. We don't sample our lakes very much. So we have 35,000 lakes in the state. We have 11,000 over five acres, but we only sample a couple 300 of those with a volunteer monitoring program and a few through USGS and NOAA. Um, and so we don't have a statewide funded lakes program, which is sad because we have some of the highest quality lakes in the in the country um, and they are degrading and we don't have a good handle on why or where. And um, if you have looked at the news, there's some stuff about Torch Lake up north um, with an algae, blue green or a golden brown algae on the bottom. I'm also trying to help with that problem, figuring out why it's there, probably related partially to climate change at least, um, and then how to fix it um, because they it's escalating and they're not sure how to fix it. And so people will often send me samples from these kinds of systems and I tell them what algae is there and when it's gone and then they can figure out how to test for the toxins and then ultimately how to manage the system. So Phycotech does something in a way that no other company does. This picture here, uh, that algae is called serration. It's actually uh, from a marine environment, it's actually from the ocean. Um, but this is a permanent mount. And I am the only one in the country that does permanent mounts on a production basis. So I did that because I had children and limited time. <laughs> so it allows me to count a lot more samples per day and per year than on a single counter basis than other labs. And I have a permanent archive. So I can go back to any sample I've counted back to 1986 and um, be able to look at it. And it'll look just the same as it did in 1986. We're considered um, the standard for how to do that. And um, I am admittedly a jack of all trades and a master of none. So uh, I am good at a lot of different groups of algae, more so than most other phycologists, but I'm not an expert on any one that makes me better adapted for this type of work, which is looking at pieces, parts of things, but not necessarily uh, to be an expert in culturing or genetics or genetic analysis or qPCR, which is um, highly technical work, also takes a long time. Um, and I can do what I do in a matter of seconds, whereas it takes days, months to do the culturing and the genetic work that they would do to put those two parts together. So we interface, we work together. Um, over 35 years of experience, I've been in business since 1990, um, got my undergrad at Purdue and my uh, graduate degree at Notre Dame. I do not have a master's, I went direct PhD. I am certified as a, a certified late professional which means I have a, I'm not a manager. I don't go out and manage systems. I provide highly concentrated data for them to manage systems. And um, I am on the Inland Hab Group at the North American Lake Management Society and a part coordinator for standard methods. So standard methods is uh, of uh, examination of water and wastewater is where all the EPA methods are put together for people who have to do work like I do, including hardcore chemistry. Um, I have part 10,000. There's nine chapters before that that are all hardcore chemistry. So um, mine's a little bit different, I think funner. Um, I get to do a job every day that I love. Um, I'm very blessed that way. I get to work in a super cool microscope, also very blessed. I get to work with people from all over the world. So if I can't go all over the world, I at least get to talk to people from all over the world. I get to work, wear jeans to work, uh, lately sweats, <laughs> sometimes shorts. Um, sometimes I don't get dressed, I have to admit that. Um, I get to learn new things every day. It's never boring. Uh, I thought about that when I went into this, uh, this particular area of study. I had a chance to go into vertebrate ecology. I originally worked with wolves and sharks, um, but then we do something fun about five minutes every day. Um, and this is definitely challenging every minute of every day. 
I get to work on new technologies. Um, I have to admit I'm a bit ADD. And so changing tasks all the time actually works to my advantage. And I get to make my own decisions about my priorities. Um, the bad part of that is I have to go to this job I love every day because uh, there's payroll every single, every other week. And I have to pay for that super cool microscope. Um, and uh, that that's a reality of life, right? So, um, and sometimes there's no answers to the technical questions I have. So that makes it a little bit more challenging for me. People tend to leave my area of study because it's uh, subjective. And sometimes you just can't answer the question. Um, I'm the only one to blame when my priorities are screwed up. And I am challenged all the time. It makes me a better scientist. It makes me a better psychologist. Uh, it also stresses the crap out of me sometimes. Um, so I am constantly QA'd by people from all levels. Um, it's a good thing, actually. Um, again, I've worked all over the country. Um, and this actually isn't all of our, all of our um, sample sites. Um, when I am interviewing people uh, for uh, both as part of, um, I am on a few national boards and we have had to do job searches. So for environmental scientists. So I always look for things like passion and a sense of wonder for hard workers, um, innovative, the ability to do it, perseverance. But I got to tell you, the two that are hardest to find are hard workers and people who are perseverant. We spend our time at FICO Tech outside the box. And um, that means you have, to, you have to whack at things a lot. You have to, it, science is an iterative process. And so when you go through and you try something, it doesn't work, all that's telling you is you need to try it a different way. So um, as Edison said, he didn't fail 2000 times, he found 2000 ways not to make a light bulb. So uh, you, know, you have to, in each time you go through that process, you learn something and that throws you to the next, the next dichotomous ch choice you have to make. So um, it's an iterative process and you have to not give up. If you like things more controlled, then you need to be in a standard production kind of chemistry if that's what you choose or that kind of job that doesn't have as much choice and doesn't have as much decision making. But um, you know, being a hard worker and being persevering are huge because it's easy to find people who are smart and it's easy to find people who are relatively innovative. Um, having passion, being perseverant, being a hard worker, those are hard attributes to find. Um, I'm a geek and I embrace it. So, uh, and I'm a biologist at heart. I'm always gonna look for the organism. Uh, I have, uh, most people who do what I do have to have a master's or a PhD. Some have an MMD as well. Um, and that's because biology is a huge, big area. Chemistry is somewhat similar. So you can be a tech in chemistry, um, but chances are if you want to do anything um, that is uh, that is innovative or at a higher level, you're going to have to have a master's or, or a PhD. Um, most of the folks I interface with, with work mostly in federal government, state government. I have some academic partners um, and I do a lot of consulting at the at the Lake Association level as well. And um, this is a great uh, environmental science is challenging. It's rewarding. It's not necessarily high paying. So uh, my son just graduated with a mechanical engineering degree. And he actually, uh, right out of undergrad, without any other certification, is earning as much as I am. Now, I made that choice. I can pay my bills and be super happy. Um, but you have to be pretty high up in the federal government or a different kind of company to earn, you know, over $100,000. Um, and that's important because you need to know where your level is of comfort. If you're a chemist, you're going to have a higher level of People will pay more for chemistry than they will pay for biology. I made those choices and I'm super happy with that. I chose to keep my company small because my only other choices were to go big and manage and not count. And that would make me not a happy Ian um, or to work for somebody else, which wouldn't work well with my lifestyle. So um, I would have to go into Chicago. I would have to go into Detroit or, or Indianapolis to get a job, which would be consistent with my level of education, do the job I want to do. So my choice was to actually make my own job. And I am super happy with that. Um, I interface with all these people oh, all the time. Um, so uh, the interesting thing is lawyers and judges. I never thought uh, in my life that I would interface with lawyers and judges, but I do do expert, uh, expert um, testimony on occasion. And that has included um, everything from just environmental impact all the way up to a capital murder trial, um, and um, which I won't ever be doing again. 
Um, so I actually do have to deal sometimes with litigation, not something I would have thought I would have had to have done. Um, and, uh, you know, all these different people are impacted by different parts of my job. And so uh, amazingly, I work with all these people all the time. So I also, my outreach is environmentally uh, education oriented. So I get to do upstream and Sam in the classroom and science Olympiad. Those will look different this year. As you all know, you know, you're wearing masks. I'm not because I'm alone in my basement. Um, my cat might have a mask though. I thought about it. Um, but, you know, we're doing upstream virtually. I'm lecturing virtually, hopefully in the spring we can get in the field. We're doing Science Olympiad virtually. Uh, as Ms. Schneider knows, uh, it is a little challenging. Um, we can't actually do hands-on, but we can do uh, study for the test. And we're gonna do that with mentors by, uh, by Google Meet. Um, Sam, the classroom we're gonna put off for a year. Um, we have to uh, feed these fish three times a day once they, once they start eating. And that's pretty cumbersome if we have to go home for any reason. And my staff and I get the, the burden of that. So um, Sam, the classroom will have to wait till next year, but the rest of the stuff we're gonna keep doing. Um, I get to go some pretty cool places. Uh, I won't this year, but I in the past have gotten to go to some, pre some pretty cool places. I don't travel very much. Um, I'm mostly at my lab, but I have gotten to go to Alaska and these are my pictures. So. Um, I've gotten to go to Alaska and uh, that was the coolest whale and she had a calf with her. Um, to uh, British Columbia, I've gotten to go to uh, British Columbia actually two or three times. I've been to both Banff and Lake Louise um, and Lake Louise was, was uh, beautiful. It was absolutely stunning um, and I almost got to see Grizzly but missed him by just minutes actually. Um, been to Denver, which was fun too. Um, I have a friend who actually goes camping with, with llamas. <laughs> so um, these are like his pets and he takes them camping. Um, and we uh, often when we're on, uh, when I go to work, when I go to meetings, I do a workshop on algae every year and we go sampling. And so it's a whole day of just driving everywhere we can and sampling every ditch and pond and lake we can find. And it's a lot of fun. And um, it's my primary way of getting field samples. So, and uh, if I were at my lab, this would be my super cool microscope. Um, and, um, you know, it's great. It's an awesome microscope. And I now have a new camera on top of my microscope and a new computer. But, um, but you know, it's, I work in half light. Um, I get to have my light on right now because I'm talking to you. But this microscope, you can notice that my light is half dim. And that's because I use, see that green glow right there? I use uh, epifluorescence. So I have to have the light at half light to do that. Um, I'm very happy when I get to come up into the light uh, during the day. So, and these are some of the pictures I've taken on my microscope. These are all samples. Um, this is that, that, what that green light does. It makes things glow, it is so cool. Um, that is actually from the ocean. Uh, and then these are our different algae uh, actually from around here. Um, this is Kara. So if any of you guys live over near Singer Lake, there's a great Kara bed over there. Um, and uh, we just went and collected again a couple couple days ago. I did a workshop for a meeting. So um, I wanted to be able to show them what Kara looked like. And I was a little worried it was an invasive species of starry stonewort, um, but it's not 99.9% uh, .9 sure it actually is Kara. So I, I was happy about that. And then these are also samples I've taken from around here. You swim with these in the lake, actually these little guys all the time um, and, and Singer Lake as well. Um, this is Euglena. Euglenas have eye spots. So this is one thing is um, that that really confuses people about algae is that they are trash cans evolutionarily. So they are in many different actually groups and kingdoms. Cyanobacteria, the hab algae, they they are Monera. They're in the bacteria. Um, the only thing that algae have in common is chlorophyll A. So and you can't see it, but I actually have chlorophyll A chemical chlorophyll A earrings on, um, and. Um, you know, something like Euglena, it is considered a prozoan. So, but it still photosynthesizes and that's why they're all together in the algae. And so I actually have to know a lot of biology from a lot of different groups at once. So, um, I believe uh, I was asked to do about 35 and we're at 34 minutes. So I have plenty of time to answer questions. All right, so, um, Desmond, you are muted. Um, there you go. There we go. <laughs> All 
All right, questions from the class. Remember, say your name, your school, ask your question. Yeah, I saw that. Anybody in class has questions? I have a lot of questions. I'll start off with a question I had. So do you have opportunities and to, um, for high school students to work with you maybe like during the summertime or something? I absolutely do. Um, this year, uh, we had a we actually, one of my students is from uh, St. Joe High School and we had to work out a way for him to work um, remotely. And so we left work for him outside and then he went and did it. But I generally have two to three high school college students every summer, a combination, and they work together. And they do a combination of, um, of doing work uh, out in the gardens that we maintain. And then also they usually have a project that they work on the lab and they help with lab maintenance. Um, so yeah, I absolutely do. All right. Um, so Tanya had actually asked a question in the chat um, about do I come across algae that I haven't seen before or have a hard time identifying? all the time um you know there's a hundred over a hundred thousand species of algae well over um and um the project i'm working on right now with utah and zion national park we are they, they are having um dog deaths from people who are going out into the park and walking their dogs along the virgin river and we are trying to definitively identify the algae that are producing the toxin and um right now we're between, they send the samples to me. I identify what I think it is. I'm working with three other experts, um, one out of uh, Florida and two, and then some folks out of California. So I send my stuff to the guy in Florida. He cultures it. He just sent his culture off to the folks in California who are trying to um, do the genetic analysis so that we can definitively identify what it is we're working for, looking for, because it doesn't look like a blue green bloom in the water. It looks like it's, like it's a diatom. So, uh, you know, yes, all the time. And that's, that's the most challenging part of my job is that um, sometimes with biology, the stuff is preserved. 95% of my samples are preserved. So I don't have the chance to see things move. Um, don't, can't see reproductive structures. It, I have to do a lot of decision making in my job. Okay. Back to my class. You guys have any questions? Okay, let me ask a, a few chemistry based questions and you guys better take notes when she answers <laughs> okay <laughs> all right just warning you what nutrients lead to like these algae blooms so there's actually some contention over that um the two my two major ones are obviously nitrogen and phosphorus right nitrogen there are, phosphorus. and okay. phosphorus right and the two bioavailable uh parts of that are nitrate and phosphate, NO3 and PO4. You guys got that? Nitrate and phosphate? All right. <laughs> okay, so, um, but it gets more complicated because it's not so much just the absolute amount of either of those, it's the ratio of the two of them. Mm -hmm. So um, blue-green algae, cyanobacteria, do really well with a high phosphate and a low nitrate ratio because this, many of them that produce toxins have structures that allow them to fix their own nitrogen. Mm -hmm. So, and that their ability to do that is based on the ability to have the environment be anoxic or without oxygen. Mm -hmm. Well, most of our lakes have oxygen, mm -hmm. so they should. <laughs> so how does that work? Well, they have a structure that actually um, excludes oxygen. And then they have a, an enzyme called nitrogenase that is in that structure that allows them to break down the N2 to the NO3 ultimately. So um, they can take advantage of that. There are some ecologists, some plankton ecologists who feel that um, although, not, although phosphate sets the ceiling, that it's really the nitrate that is important. Um, and there's some indications that nitrate are important, nitrate levels are important for toxin production. We don't know why these algae produce toxins. So um, that's a long answer to your question. <laughs> oh, it's, it's good, it's good. So I'm assuming then as a follow-up that most of the chemical analysis that you might be involved in involves the nitrate, you know, finding the levels of nitrate and phosphate. Is that the correct assumption? 
Well, it is, but um, because the dynamics of phosphate in the environment are uh, tied to oxygen, um, we also have to have oxygen and pH. So okay. the, the thing is, is that when the water goes anoxic, um, there is a chemical, um, iron oxide, that, that dissociates when the water goes anoxic. Iron oxide binds phosphate. So when that goes anoxic, it liberates the phosphate. And then that phosphate can diffuse to upper levels and fuel the algae blooms. Um, the more organic material you have in the bottom of the lake, degrading what we call biological oxygen demand, the more likely it's gonna go anoxic and the more likely you're gonna liberate all that phosphate. So you need to understand that dynamic of oxygen, phosphate, nitrate, also what we call species of those. So there's nitri nitrogen, which is N2, that's atmospheric nitrogen. And then there's, ni then there's nitrite, right. or then there's ammonia, nitrite, and nitrate. And so bacteria are responsible for that, for that train. Mm -hmm. In phosphate, it is more physically dominated. So it doesn't necessarily require bacteria to go from phosphorus to phosphate. And so they're, they're guided by different processes. Some are biologically mediated and some aren't. Um, and the pH is important in all that. Um, and turns out there was a, a fish kill in North Carolina. Uh, somebody went to a workshop of mine, just sent me a sample. The thing that actually killed the fish was not necessarily the toxin that the algae were producing. The thing that killed the fish was the fact that there was tons of degradation. They drove the pH super high and there was ammonia. It caused ammonia in the water and that high ammonia is what killed the fish. So even though uh, you, know, you think about, oh, well, we're mostly interested in what drives the growth of the algae, we have to look for all of that stuff all the time. Uh, aluminum is super important because we use that to help control phosphate. Uh, we put alum. Uh, if the pH is too low, aluminum will kill the fish. <laughs> so that's bad. Um, so we're looking at metals. We're looking at nutrients. We're looking at oxygen. Temperature is very important because temperature drives oxygen concentration in water. Um, that's, you know, standard gas law. So the lower the temp, the more oxygen it holds. The higher the temp, the less oxygen it holds. Um, that's why temperature is considered uh, thermal pollution is a problem because you jack up the temperature, you lower the oxygen, you stress the fish and you encourage bad algae. So uh, all this stuff, we're, we're very integrative. Aquatic ecology is very integrative with chemistry, biology and physics. Okay, very good questions to ask mm -hmm. my students here. So to just to clarify, anoxic means lack of oxygen? Mm -hmm. Anoxigen, anoxic means water down to zero. Now for fish, Having low oxygen means below two milligrams per liter. But for chemistry, it's got to be 0.2 or below for it to be considered anoxic. Of, uh, and that, that goes back to like the dead zones in, in the Gulf and things like that. 0.2 or lower of oxygen concentration. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, again, do you guys have any questions? Go ahead. Say your name and. Um, Parker from Nile. What's the largest? Oh, so, um, so probably the largest consulting job I've done is uh, Great Lakes sampling with the EPA. Um, that involved hundreds of samples and contracts that were several hundred thousand dollars um, over those big sampling. It won't happen this year. Um, it didn't happen last year. The um, EPA has been severely cut back. But um, generally, those are because they have this huge grid that they sample the Great Lakes on. Um, I get hundreds of samples and uh, it is it disrupts my lab actually because that's all we do for like three months, four months is do those samples. Um, but that's probably the biggest one. I have also sued the federal government over uh, over projects before as well. <laughs> and one. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, any question? Um, I have another question. So with your chemical analysis, I'm assuming that you send that out, you subcontract it? We do. Um, do that too? 
so lat we i could do it um that's called oh. wet chemistry i could do it but okay. we are so full doing the taxonomy um i would have to hire a biochemist um to be able to do that kind of stuff and we don't have a footprint mm -hmm. so there are other there are literally dozens of companies in the u.s um probably 100 or so that are competent at that there's about 10 or 15 that are competent in algal toxins um, I have five competitors that do what I do. So I decided my business strategy, this actually goes to my business strategy, is that um, if any of you guys ever want to read a good business book, good to great, uh, it's a great book to read. And um, that part of the core of that book is your what they call your core competency or your wheelhouse and mine is taxonomy. I'm good at it. I really like it. Um, our facility is well set up for it. And so um, that's where we decided to concentrate and not to spread out to algal toxins, which would be logical, um, or uh, or to do uh, to do water chemistry. So I send it out. I actually send it out to Great Lakes Environmental in Traverse City. Okay. Last question I have is: What are some of the health effects of algae blooms? So it's interesting. Um, they they go all the way from skin rashes to death um if you have watched uh there was a thing on cnn and weather channel and cnn over the last couple of years about algal toxins and i was frustrated by those because both of those indicated that animals could die but people could not and that's not true um other countries have had and we have in this country had suspected deaths but other countries china south africa africa brazil uh, australia um Europe, um, all of those areas, countries, consortiums have all had human deaths from algal toxins. Um, so there are liver toxins and neurotoxins and, and what they call dermatoxins. So you can get rashes all over your body. The most common is the stomach. It starts with a stomach upset, seizures. Uh, the one death that we think in the US, uh, there were six kids uh, from a soccer team who hopped a fence at a golf course in Wisconsin. All six got sick, two had seizures, one died. Um, and there was a high bloom of, um, of Dilichospermum lemmermanii in the pond. So um, at that time, 20 years ago, they didn't have a great way to do all the chemistry they needed to do to confirm that was what it was. But, um, but they're, I mean, they're 99% sure that's what it was. So, you know, you get sick to your stomach, it does cause cancer. These toxins, especially microcystin can cause cancer. Um, and there's some links to neurodiseases in New York. They've started to look at um, associations of hotspots of ALS, Parkinson's, and MS with uh, persistent microcystis blooms, like in Central Park. Um, people who live on lakes that have persistent microcystis blooms. And um, the evidence is a little scary. Uh, there is some good evidence to show that um, if you live on a lake with persistent blooms, that your chances of getting a neuro disease could be higher. It is so far anecdotal um, because again, can't find a control and you can't do a randomized study, right? So it's it's going to be a lot of sleuthing um, just like with smoking, right? It took them a very long time to figure out what those effects and associations were. Mm -hmm. So everything from a skin rash to stomach problems, to seizures, to tumors down the line to death. It is, it is a, and there is no treatment. It is you either survive or you don't. And every time you're exposed, you lose life days. Wow. Okay, we want to thank you, Dr. Anne St. Amand, mm -hmm. very much. All right, well, thank you guys. I appreciate the chance to talk to you. Okay, we'll stay in touch. Yeah, and if any of your kids want to contact me about career stuff or life stuff, um, they're welcome to, just email me. Yep, if you want to do a PSA on topics that you heard today, um, I'm pretty sure again, you'll be able to, you know, talk to them and guide them along. Sure, all right. All right. Thank you. Thank you, bye, have a good day. You too. Thanks.